Good evening. My name is Liz Kruger. I'm the Senator for the 28th District. Welcome tonight, which is April 7th, 21, from 7 to 8.30 this evening. We are having a live virtual town hall on ranked choice voting, just the basics. So many of us believe we know how to vote. We have gone to perhaps every election since we were 18 years old. And so we think, what do we need to learn? But this year in New York City, we have changed things up quite a bit, as you will soon see. So we wanna make sure that people have the opportunity to learn what it's gonna be like when they go in to vote in June, or when they don't go in to vote, they vote at home through a paper ballot and complete their vote that way. So whether you're planning to vote through the mail, vote through one of the early voting sites, or vote on election day through your normal um, voting process over the years, just know that ballot and how you're going to vote and who you're gonna vote for are gonna be a very different set of options. I want to welcome our participants, Dr. Sarah Saeed and Ali Swatek, and they will be presenting soon. This is an important roundtable that you may be watching on Zoom or Facebook, or you may be calling into the roundtable discussion today. Before I get on to the proceedings, I want you to be aware that we have closed captioning options as a viewer, you have to activate the closed captioning to view the text on your device. If you're here in a Zoom, click on live transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. If you're in the Facebook Live event, you'll see a setting button in the bottom right-hand corner of the video, click, click closed caption CC, to start viewing closed captioning. We've really found that having the closed caption options means a lot of things to people who may not necessarily define themselves as fully deaf, but have hearing disabilities and disadvantages, which happens to many of us as we start to age. So the CC options that are available are really terrific. Before I begin tonight's event, I want to go over some quick vaccine updates because there's something new every day. As of yesterday, all New Yorkers 16 plus are eligible to get vaccinated. People who are 16 or 17 must get a Pfizer vaccination as this is the one vaccine that has been approved for individuals this young. Starting today, if you are 75 or older, you and a companion can go to the, if, you're, if you live in my district, no, start again. You don't have to live in my district, but we chose the one location that happens to be in my district to tell you about. So starting today, 75 and up, there are a number of different pop-up sites that you can simply walk into without an appointment and get your vaccine. The location closest to most of my constituents is at the Ford Foundation, 321 East 42nd Street. Again, you don't need an appointment in advance. The site will be open from Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And there are a number of other pop-up sites throughout the city of New York um, if you find them more convenient. The New York City Health Department is concerned that the number of people getting tested for COVID-19 is decreasing. Getting tested is important because it helps the city track variants as well as break the chain of transmission. So if you think there is any reason you have been exposed to COVID, you're not feeling well, it's so much easier now to get a COVID test, test or find one that you really should not feel discouraged and we encourage you. Get the COVID test. It doesn't matter whether you've had them before. 
because you can get exposed to COVID obviously at any time. Even if you're fully vaccinated, the city health department recommends that you get tested monthly as well as prior to visiting an unvaccinated person who is at higher risk of developing a severe case of COVID-19. And if you develop COVID-19 symptoms after visiting someone. Again, the vaccines are proving to be incredibly effective, but they are not 100% a guarantee that if exposed, you might not be able to get perhaps even a lesser version of full-fledged COVID. And now we will move to tonight's roundtable. We call it ranked choice voting, just the basics. It should provide you enough information that when you go to vote, whether with a ballot at your house or going to a site to vote in person, you'll feel familiar with what's going to happen. You should know that this event is being recorded. Everyone who RSVP'd for tonight's event will receive an email of a link to the video shortly. That is so that you can watch it again at your convenience, share it with other people. Uh, we want to make sure every New Yorker who is voting has had some exposure to the information from tonight before they actually go to vote so that it's not a shock when they walk in. New York will implement ranked choice voting for the first time during the upcoming June 22nd primary election for all municipal races, including the city council, the city controller, and mayor. If you're counting, you know that there are hundreds of people running for these seats. So there's a lot of information to try to collect up for yourself when thinking through who you want to vote for. During the virtual town hall, you will hear from the experts about the history of ranked choice voting and the mechanics of ranked choice voting process. More importantly, you will learn why this new voting process enhances the power of your vote and helps make New York City elections more democratic. We're not going to tell you who you should vote for tonight, that's your decision. But we do want to make sure you understand that in ranked choice voting, you have more options than you've had in the past. So you need to understand and think about who would you like to vote for. I am very pleased we have two wonderful presentations this evening. First, we will be hearing from Dr. Sarah Saeed. She is the chair and executive director of the New York City Civic Engagement Board, and she will be talking about the importance of civic engage engagement and give us an overview of ranked choice voting. Dr. Said will be followed by Ali Swatik. She's the Director of Policy and Research at the New York City Campaign Finance Board and will explain how ranked choice voting works and how your vote will be tallied and why ranked choice voting really makes your choice count. I get asked all the time, what's the difference if I vote or not? And the answer is, it really matters, but under a ranked choice system, everybody's votes and thoughts, because you get to choose multiple people for one seat, that your decisions truly factor into a multi-pronged analysis of who ends up winning that election. After both presentations, I will moderate a Q&A portion of the town hall and, and during which we will allow people to ask questions that are answered. You can choose to file your question through Zoom or through Facebook in the sections where you can fill in and ask a question. Um, many questions were received a bit earlier, but we also will have time, I believe, to take new questions coming in from guests who didn't have a chance 
to ask their questions earlier. I just want to mention briefly um, that if I seem tired tonight, the truth is I am. I'm coming off of an all-nighter to finish the New York State budget. And when I was in college, I could pull off an all-nighter without really thinking twice about what it, what it meant. And I could get up in the morning and just move on. I'm not a kid anymore, and I've noticed that trying to stay totally um, in my head and in my brain and body today after still being on the floor of the New York State Senate debating up till after three o'clock in the morning last night, um, it's proved to be a bit of a challenge. But I also want to tell you, 19 years in the New York State Senate, I've never been prouder of what we actually were able to accomplish with important funding for critical issues for all New Yorkers. We were able to support small businesses who have suffered through this pandemic by providing $1 billion investment in New York small business to supplement the federal aid that's also coming. We were able to provide a middle-class tax reduction. We were able to provide $1.4 billion increase in the foundation aid of public education with a commitment of a three-year phase-in. This is something that activists and parents went to court to fight for well over a decade ago. And in fact, despite the court wins and the orders and instructions for us to ensure that we had full foundation aid for every school child in New York State, it's taken forever, um, but we couldn't be happier with what we accomplished this year with the out-year commitment. We are authorizing a $3 billion Environmental Bond Act to make sure there's additional monies to mitigate some of the major problems that our environment is seeing and help move us forward into a more sustainable green future. We have fully restored AIM funding for local governments. That's more discussion outside New York City. We have improved New York's democratic process by providing $4 million for the expenses of the Independent Redistricting Commission. Yes, for 2022, we need to come up with our 10-year updates in what our districts look like. Um, we also legalized mobile sports wagering. Not one of my favorite things, but apparently some people are really looking forward to that. Um, and then a week earlier, not related to the budget, I was successful in finally passing a bill I worked on for seven years to decriminalize the use of cannabis, marijuana for private use and to expand the rules of the road for a legalized and taxed and regulated system for marijuana, for medical marijuana, and also for this growing industry of hemp CBD. So I don't want to spend any more time on those, although I actually think there are so many exciting things to talk about in the budget. But now I'm going to turn over the overview of the ranked choice voting to Dr. Sarah Saeed. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you so much, Senator Kruger, for, for your kind introduction, and more importantly, for your incredible dedication and service to New Yorkers. And thank you so much for organizing this really important town hall on ranked choice voting. And I know that you've made modernizing New York State's governmental processes and electoral system a priority. And for all those reasons, it's really an honor to be here in this virtual gathering with you and with many residents from Manhattan's east side and from throughout the city. So my name is Dr. Sarah Saeed, and I do have the pleasure of serving as the first ever chair of the and the uh, executive director of the New York City Civic Engagement Commission. As you all may remember, in 2018, New York City voters approved three ballot initiatives um, proposed by the 2018 Charter Revision Commission, which included the establishment of the Civic Engagement Commission. 
And we are a new city agency and we were formed to promote civic participation and to deepen civic trust in New York City. We believe that all New Yorkers should have the access, knowledge and confidence to engage fully with government in their communities and in elections. And that's why we're here with you tonight. As a Senator mentioned, we wanna help prepare New Yorkers with knowledge so that they will not be caught off guard when they look at their ballot in June and see a brand new ballot format. And we're really counting on you to be part of that education process. It doesn't stop with this evening and in this event, we really want you to carry it forward and share with others. Um, ranked choice voting provides New York City with a new opportunity to energize and expand participation in our electoral system. And New Yorkers will have the opportunity to vote for and rank up to five candidates in order of preference. Why does that matter? Um, ranked choice voting provides more choices for voters. Candidates who are like-minded and from underrepresented groups can run without fear of splitting the vote. Ranked choice voting also allows voters to honestly rank candidates in order of choice, knowing that if their first choice candidate doesn't win, their vote automatically counts for their next choice. This is so much better than worrying about how others will vote, which candidates are more or less likely to win or choosing the lesser of two evils. Ranked choice voting avoids costly and often low turnout runoff elections. And one of my favorite things about RCB is that it has the potential to raise coalition building among candidates. Even if a candidate knows that they won't be your first choice, they can still ask you to rank them second. And community members and voters can also build coalitions in support of more than one candidate. As many of you know, ranked choice voting is being introduced during an incredibly consequential election, as the Senator mentioned. New Yorkers will be voting on who they want for mayor, controller, public advocate, borough president, and their council member. Because of term limits, a majority of council members are turned out and New Yorkers living in their districts will choose a new council member. So these elected officials will be making decisions that affect all of our lives and the lives of our neighbors. Um, and in approaching this election, we really need to think about what issues do we care about what concerns us, what, what issues impact our neighborhood and whether it's housing, schools or safety, transportation, anything you might think of, your vote in this election will be really consequential. So we ask you to please help us spread the word about ranked choice voting and about this upcoming election. Definitely share this video uh, with your friends and family members. And thank you so much for being here and caring about civic engagement. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ali now. Thank you so much for that introduction and your opening remarks, Dr. Saeed. Um, my name is Ali Swadek. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the Campaign Finance Board. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much to Senator Kruger for inviting me and for your staff for putting on such an amazing and professional webinar experience. I'm really impressed, genuinely. <laughs> um, I'm gonna share my screen and walk all of us through our um, presentation that just covers the basics of what ranked choice voting is. So just right off the bat, um, I just want to remind everybody that these slides will be available to you if you RSVP'd for the event tonight. Um, and also, if you have questions as we move through the presentation, please feel free to post them in the Q&A box if you're on Zoom or in the chat function on Facebook. Um, just those two reminders out of the way. Um, I want to also set some expectations for what we're going to cover today. So I'm going to give a short introduction of ranked choice voting and its history. We're going to go into what is ranked choice voting um, and how it works and give you some reasons to rank um, just based on what we've seen in other places that have used ranked choice voting. And then last, I'll go through the next steps and everybody's question, which is when will I be using ranked choice voting? So for those of you who don't know what the Campaign Finance Board is, which is my employer, um, or NYC Votes, which is our voter engagement initiative, 
the Campaign Finance Board administers the city's public matching funds program. Um, and we also educate voters, again, through our NYC Votes Initiative. We had a charter mandate to conduct voter education and outreach, specifically introducing ranked choice voting to New Yorkers. And that is why I'm here talking to you today. But um, as Dr. Saeed mentioned, um, reminding folks to vote and doing civic outreach is a huge endeavor. We rely a lot on our partners and volunteers to make sure that all New Yorkers are informed with what they need to know to participate in our democracy. Um, and we specifically look to engage underrepresented communities through our outreach initiatives. If you're interested in working with us, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, and I'll also have my contact information again at the end of this presentation. Just to also speak briefly on the role of the Campaign Finance Board and the role of the Board of Elections. Um, we're both government entities that will be talking about ranked choice voting in 2021. However, as I mentioned, the CFB was given the responsibility by the city charter to conduct a specific voter education campaign. Um, we are not in charge of actually running poll sites, of implementing ranked choice voting on the ballot scanners or anything like that. That's still the job of the Board of Elections. They're designated by state law to administer all elections in New York City, including ranked choice voting elections for municipal office. Um, I will say though, we're really excited to work closely with them on making sure that as many New Yorkers as possible learn about ranked choice voting before they go to um, their polling place. But then also once they get to their polling place, um, there'll, there'll be information there as well that the Board of Elections is providing to folks to make sure that we're reaching everybody and everyone feels comfortable completing their ballot. So just to start off with the most basic question, what is ranked choice voting? So as Dr. Saeed mentioned, ranked choice voting is just a new way for voters to elect their representatives in New York City. Voters can rank up to five candidates in order of preference instead of choosing just one. And this gives voters more say in who wins. It increases civility amongst candidates and it can also lead to more diverse candidates winning. Um, and the reason why I'm saying those three benefits is um, this is what we've seen in jurisdictions who have implemented ranked choice voting. So I know we like to think, you know, New York is the, the best city in the country and we're, you know, incredibly innovative. We do everything first. We did not do ranked choice voting first. There are 17 other US cities, including San Francisco, Minneapolis and Santa Fe that use ranked choice voting for their municipal elections. The entire state of Maine and soon the entire state of Alaska will use ranked choice voting to elect their state and federal representatives. Um, and I'm saying soon Alaska will use it because ranked choice voting is growing. This year, we're going to use it for the first time. Six additional cities voted last year to start using it in the future. Um, so it is growing, which is kind of exciting to be a part of. And then last but not least, depending on how you feel about some of the best picture winners in the last couple of years, um, it, depending on that, it could be a selling point, but the Academy Awards uses ranked choice voting to select their best picture winner. So how did ranked choice voting get to New York City? Um, in November 2019, 74% of New York City voters voted yes on ballot question one to establish ranked choice voting in some local elections. It was put on the ballot by the 2019 Charter Revision Commission. Um, but it's important to know that this reform was approved by voters. It wasn't something that was passed by the city council or by you know, the governor's office through an executive order. This was voted on by New York City voters. Um, I'm a huge fan of maps, so I really like this slide. It shows the level of support for the ranked choice voting ballot question across New York City. So you may notice there are some areas with greater support, there are those really dark green areas. Um, and then there's those that had less support there, um, this burnt orange brownish color. Um, folks who I may be speaking to who are in Senator Kruger's district, um, you can see based on the map, you know, on the east side of Manhattan, it looks like there was a decent level of support between 70 and 80% of the folks that turned out to vote in those districts. Um, voted yes on this ballot question. So it's always good to know where we stand 
Um, sometimes if you're doing outreach in places that didn't support the ballot question as much, you may encounter some skepticism right off the bat, but we're not really dealing with that here so much. So it's good to know. Here is a cheat sheet for ranked choice voting in New York City. Um, so first and foremost, it's going to be used starting in January 1st, 2021. Um, that's why you haven't heard about it until this year. This is the first year we're going to be using ranked choice voting. It will be used in special and primary elections for city office only, not in general elections. Um, and this is a question I get sometimes. A special election happens when the person who's currently in office, um, uh, they either die or the office becomes vacant for other reasons um, and you hold a special election. So we're using ring choice voting in special elections and then primary elections as well. Um, the five city offices that will use ranked choice voting to, to be elected are mayor, public advocate, comptroller, borough president, and city council. Um, and as Dr. Saeed mentioned, a lot of the city council um, is term, lim term limited out this year, as well as um, the city, the two citywide offices of mayor and comptroller. So there's a lot of folks running for office. We will be electing them using ranked choice voting in the primary election. Um, but we will not be using ranked choice voting for federal or state races like president, Congress, or governor. And we won't be using it in local races like district attorney. Um, and I feel like this is worth mentioning a couple of times because I know I'm speaking to an audience that is probably located in Manhattan. You're going to be voting for a new district attorney. That will be a single choice election. Um, how we've elected uh, that office before, but you will also on the same ballot have a ranked choice voting election for these five citywide offices. So that's important to know. How does ranked choice voting change city elections? So I kind of went over this just a little bit ago. Um, we used single choice elections where voters choose only one candidate for each office and the candidate with the highest number of votes wins to elect our city officials prior to using ranked choice voting. Um, and again, voters are still going to use single choice elections for all elections for federal, state, and some local offices like district attorney and for general elections for city office. This is the second part about how ring choice voting changes city elections. Um, we also had runoff elections for citywide office. So if no candidate received more than 40% of the total primary election vote for mayor, public advocate, and comptroller, a runoff election took place. Um, the good news here, because, ring because runoff elections tended to have really low turnout um, and also required that the voter come back two to four weeks later for a whole nother election to determine who the winner would be. Um, ranked choice voting eliminates all runoff elections. So that's the good thing to know here. We're still going to use single choice elections in some races, but we will not have runoff elections any longer. Okay, so how does ranked choice voting work? I've told you a lot about it, but I haven't actually told you how it works. Um, I think the best way of explaining it is by showing our um, incredible video to you. I'm a huge fan of it. Um, it repeats a little bit of the information I already explained to you, but I think it's worth it just for um, the benefit of being able to see how ranked choice voting works using this video. So I'm gonna press play here. There's a new way for New Yorkers to have their say in city elections, a way that gives voters more choices and can lead to more diverse winners. It's called ranked choice voting. 74% of New York voters chose to use it in primary and special elections for city offices, mayor, public advocate, comptroller, borough president, and city council. You won't see ranked choice voting in general elections or elections for state or national offices. But in ranked choice voting elections, you can now rank up to five of your favorite candidates for each office. Here's how ranked choice voting works. On your ballot, You'll see candidates listed in rows and numbered rankings and columns. Pick your first choice and completely fill in the oval next to their name under the first column. Like always, you can just vote for your one favorite candidate and submit your ballot. But you might like several people. If you have a second choice, fill in the oval next to their name under the second column. 
Do the same thing for your third, fourth, and fifth choices if you have them. A few don'ts. Don't rank the same candidate more than once. It won't help them, and it takes away your chance to rank the others who are running. Don't give the same rank to multiple candidates. It could disqualify your ballot. Don't worry. This is a new process, and you can always ask a poll worker for help, or for a new ballot if you make a mistake. So, how do ballots get counted with ranked choice voting? If one candidate gets more than 50% of everyone's first choice votes, they win the election right away. That's it. If no candidate gets more than 50%, ballots will be counted in rounds. Round by round, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated. So, if your top-rated candidate is eliminated, your vote goes to your next highest choice. This keeps going until only two candidates remain. The person with the most votes wins. Ranked choice voting is already popular in many cities around the country because voters find that it helps more voices be heard. Now it's our turn. Get answers to your questions and learn more at nyccfb.info slash rcv. Okay, so hopefully that was illustrative for folks, but I'm gonna go over just a couple more reminders for everyone so that you didn't have to you know, take notes while you were watching that video. I'm gonna go through the steps for how to mark a ballot now. Um, as you can see on the screen, I'm showing a sample ballot here that lists five candidates in rows. And then at the top, there's one, two, three, four, five to represent your choices at the top as columns. So the way that the ballot's set up is kind of like a grid. You're, if you've taken a standardized test in school, you know, you fill in the oval um, to, to fill in your answer. It's a similar way. So the first step is you pick your first choice candidate and completely fill in the oval next to their name under the first column. Um, as you can see here, we're choosing candidate B as number one. Um, if you have a second choice candidate, fill in the oval next to their name under the second column. In our example here, we're selecting candidate C as choice two. Um, and then it goes on from there. We're choosing candidate A as choice three, candidate E as choice four, and candidate D as choice five. You can rank up to five candidates, but you can still choose to vote for only one candidate if you prefer. You can also choose to just vote for three candidates. Um, it's up to you as the voter. The way that I describe it is you choose your favorite candidate first, your second favorite candidate second, your third favorite candidate third, but if you run out of favorite candidates, you do not need to rank all five candidates. You can rank up to five, but you don't need to rank all five. Something else to note um, that's just basically a little bit of common sense, all of the candidates who qualify for the ballot are going to appear on the ballot but just voters can rank a maximum of five. So if you see in this example ballot on the screen, there are, I think it's eight candidates. I always miscount. <laughs> There's eight candidates listed um, and still you can only rank five. So again, just a maximum of five. And folks like to ask this question too. If you wanna vote for a write-in candidate, you can just do it the same way you always would. Um, you write their name in the write-in line and fill in the oval to rank your choice in the column that you wanna rank them. So we can see we wrote in candidate X at the bottom here and filled in the oval in rank one. Um, and that's, that's exactly how you vote for a write-in candidate. There are two potential ballot marking errors that we went over in the video, but I just wanna highlight them again for voters because it's really important to mark your ballot correctly. So the first error is called overvoting. And this is when you give multiple candidates the same rank. So we can see in the example ballot I have here on the screen, candidate B and candidate C are both ranked as number one. Um, this is wrong. If you do this, it will not be clear who you intended to vote for. You're basically telling um, the, the ballot that you're trying to rank the same person for the same rank, to, sorry, two candidates for the same rank. This will invalidate your ballot. Um, the good thing about voting in person is that the ballot scanner, after you complete your ballot, you go to your ballot scanner, you feed it into the machine, it will reject your ballot if you vote this way. 
and then you can request a new ballot and fill it out correctly. And there'll be someone standing next to that scanner to help you out who's a poll worker. Um, but if you're voting at home um, on an absentee ballot, you know you put it in the mail or you put it in a drop box, you don't put your own ballot in the scanner. So you may not realize that you did you made this error and it will invalidate your ballot um, for that race. So it's important to know this, do not overvote, do not give multiple candidates the same rank. The second ballot marking error is called duplicate ranking. And that's when a voter ranks a candidate more than once. And you can see in the sample, um, candidate B is ranked one, two, three, four, and five. Um, if you do this, only your top ranking for the candidate will count because as we saw in the video, your vote only moves to your second, third, fourth, or fifth choice if your first choice is eliminated. If your first choice is never eliminated, it never moves to your second, third, fourth, or fifth choice. Um, if you just have one candidate who you feel really strongly about and you don't wanna choose any of the other candidates or rank them, you can fill out your ballot as just, you know, candidate B, rank one, and submit your ballot. You don't need to rank two, three, four, or five. Um, however, we do encourage folks to rank. Um, there's a reason why it was designed this way. There's lots of good reasons to want to rank, and we want to emphasize that if you do rank, it does not harm your first choice candidate. So this is a ballot marking error that does not invalidate your ballot, but you run the risk of your vote um, being exhausted. Basically, when your candidate that you ranked one is eliminated, if they're, if they're eliminated, there's no other place for your vote to go. There's no second choice on your ballot. So you don't get the full experience of ranked choice voting. Okay, some main takeaways from, for voters. Um, first step on how to complete the ballot. Rank only one candidate in each numbered column. Do not rank the same candidate more than once. And remember, you can always ask for another ballot if you make a mistake in person, or even if you request an absentee ballot, you can call up the Board of Elections and request another one. Um, another takeaway is you can rank up to five candidates, but you do not need to rank a total of five. Again, you can rank just one, you can rank two, you can rank three. It's up to you, the voter. If you do rank five candidates, five votes do not get counted you always only have one active vote and it moves through your rankings depending on whether your top choice candidate at the time is eliminated in that round. Ranking other candidates does not harm your first choice. Your vote will go towards your second, third, fourth, or fifth choice only if your top choice is eliminated. And the cool thing about this is it gives you more say in who wins. If your first choice candidate is eliminated, your vote moves to your second choice. If your second choice is eliminated, your vote moves to your third choice. And by that point, your third choice candidate may be actually the person who ends up winning that race. That means that you participated in electing that winner. So here's the last piece you need to know about the logistics here. Um, when can we expect to see results? So um, as we saw in 2020, the winner of some races might not be known on election night. And the reason why um, is because it may take, uh, the, the Board of Elections must accept absentee ballots seven to 13 days after an election. The ranked choice voting tabulation process itself can happen in a matter of minutes using software. Um, a computer does that calculation, um, but it requires all ballots to be opened and all first choice votes to be counted in order to run that tabulation. So. We have to wait for the Board of Elections to receive all the absentee ballots that were, um, that were gonna be sent back to them. And also voters need to have enough time to fix their absentee ballots if they made an error on um, the envelope. So this is really important to know. It may take a bit to know the results of the race, um, but this is as a result of the way that our absentee ballot process works not related to the ranked choice voting tabulation process necessarily. They're kind of working in tandem here, but ultimately we wanna make sure that everybody's vote counts. So this is really important. Okay, I'm gonna go through some reasons you may wanna rank. Um, 
there are some folks who very strongly feel that they want to continue doing uh, single choice elections. And you certainly can do that. You can rank just one candidate as rank one and submit your ballot. But there are plenty of reasons why you want to rank. Um, the first one is voters have more say in who gets elected. And I think you kind of understand that a little intuitively based on what I've explained. The second is that candidates are more likely to appeal to a wider audience. And the third is that voters elect more diverse candidates. Um, and this is based in research that we've seen in places that have already used ranked choice voting. So like San Francisco, for example, or Santa Fe or Minneapolis, this is what they've seen um, in places that use ranked choice voting moving from single choice. So just to go into a little bit more detail about that first point, um, voters have more say in who gets elected. The reason why is because even if your top choice does not win, you can still help choose who does because if your first choice candidate loses, you still have your second, third, fourth, and fifth choice candidates on your ballot. You can vote for your top choice first without worrying about who is likely to win. Um, and I think Dr. Saeed hinted at this a little bit in her intro. Voters don't have to vote strategically. There's been many instances in my past where I've voted for um, the candidate who I thought was the most electable instead of my favorite candidate because I didn't want another candidate to win instead of them. Um, you don't have to make those decisions anymore. You can vote for your favorite candidate first and your second favorite candidate second, and then you can vote for the candidate you think is most electable. And in that case, your vote may contribute to electing any one of those three. But the important thing is you don't have to make that strategic decision. The second point about candidates being more likely to appeal to a wider audience um, is pretty intuitive also. So candidates are not only asking for uh, first choice votes, they're not just talking to their base of voters, they are, they are asking for second, third, fourth, or fifth choice votes, which leads them to appeal to voters instead of attacking each other, which is great. Um, voters hear from more candidates who are not only campaigning for those first choice votes. Um, there's also more civility and less negativity in campaigning. Um, in some instances, there's even been um, coalition building, which is what Dr. Said alluded to, where candidates actually co-endorse each other, um, even though they're running against each other in the same race. They say, you know, vote for me first, but vote for um, Dr. Said second, please. And that's an interesting thing that we haven't really seen in New York. It's just a, like a little bit different way of campaigning from candidates, um, but it means that they're friendly to each other and they're less negative, which voters love. The third point is that voters elect more diverse candidates. So in ranked choice voting cities, elected officials are more representative of the communities they serve. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, just some examples. In its first year of using ranked choice voting, Minneapolis elected its first two transgender council members. In seven cities that use ranked choice voting, they have 50% or more women or people who identify as women in their city legislature. And in the 13 largest municipalities that use ranked choice voting, six have women mayors and four have black, Latino, or Asian mayors. Um, I think we all know this. In New York, we, um, we have a very diverse body of people who represent us in the city council. Um, but from the city, from the citywide level, um, we know that we've never had a woman mayor. Um, David Dinkins is our, is, was a black man. Um, he's the only person of color to be elected mayor. Um, so that, in, that's intuitive for voters. They understand how it's great that ranked choice voting benefits um, benefits folks to make sure that voters are electing candidates who are diverse to be their representatives. Um, in cities with ranked choice voting, more women candidates and women of color, women candidates of color get elected and also more run. Um, we're seeing that right now actually in the uh, races that are going on for municipal office for the primary, which is really exciting. Okay, the last part going to cover when will ranked choice voting be used. Um, it was already used 
four different times in New York City um, in special elections that took place in Queens and the Bronx. So in Queens Council District 24, voters elected James Gennaro to be their uh, city council member. Queens Council District 31 voters elected Sylvina Brooks Powers to be their city council member. And for the two races that took place in the Bronx, we're still awaiting those results um, because we're still waiting for absentee ballots to come in. But the important thing to know is we've already used ranked choice voting in New York in these special election districts. And what we're seeing is the voters who voted in these races liked ranked choice voting and they understood how to use it, which is great. For most of you on this um, training, you will likely use um, ranked choice voting for the first time in the citywide primary elections, which are happening on June 22nd. Early voting starts on June 12th and runs to June 20th. Um, and again, folks who can vote in the primary elections are all voters registered to a political party holding a primary, very important. So if you're not registered to a political party, you unfortunately cannot vote in the primary election. But for those of you who are, you will be voting for mayor, public advocate, comptroller, all five borough president races, and 51 city council races. We have a ton of voting resources <laughs> available to you on the New York City Campaign Finance Board's website. Um, for general voting information, you can go to voting.nyc. For specific ranked choice voting resources, we have a ranked choice voting resources page. And for that amazing video that I showed you, um, it's hosted on our YouTube channel, um, not only in English, but also in Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali, which is really exciting. Um, and you should also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at NYC Votes. Um, I also wanna highlight some voting resources that the City Board of Elections has that are really incredible. Um, the Poll Site Locator is a great website that allows you to find your early voting and election day poll site, as well as view a sample ballot. Um, and you can actually email it to yourself. So it's a really cool site. And it generally gets updated about, I would say three weeks before the election. So you can't go there now, but you should before you go and vote in June. And they also have incredible resources um, for folks who use the ballot marking device, which is a way of voting for voters with disabilities who have um, vision impairments or mobility impairments and um, can't otherwise uh, fill out a paper ballot. So you mark the ballot using this device. The Board of Elections website has a lot of good information on how to use the ballot marking device and um, how to go to a poll site and ask the poll workers there to use it. And they also have information on requesting an accessible absentee ballot, which is incredible. I think the city has done a great job of providing this resource to us too. Um, you should also follow them on Twitter and Instagram at BOENYC. All right, and last but not least, I mentioned this earlier, if you're interested in having the Campaign Finance Board come and speak to your organization um, or your church group, your PTA, uh, your co-op board, we will come and speak to basically any group about ranked choice voting. Um, because we believe it's really, this is the best way of getting out the message to New Yorkers is meet them with um, the places that they already trust. So again, uh, you can reach me at my personal email address or you can email NYC Votes and the New York City Campaign Finance Board, NYC Votes at nyccfb.info. All right, that's the end of my presentation. Great, well, that was, Really, for both of you, thank you so much. We've absorbed so much. I'm going to go start with questions, but hopefully not repeat too much of what you already answered um, in the presentation. But this stuck with me right away. So you described how you could actually negate your vote if you are voting for multiple people on ranked one. And if you go to a voting site, the machine's going to kick it out and tell you to try again. So that's great. But if you're voting at home, you don't have that option because it goes in the envelope, it goes in the mail. But we also know under state law, it's a long question, you can vote by mail 
and then change your mind and decide you actually want to vote at a polling site and that the polling site vote is the one that's going to count. So if I am a voter who's chosen absentee voting and more and more of us have now that COVID almost made it required up until now, and I think a lot of people won't go back. They like mailed in voting and they will do so. So I, I did my vote and then I don't know, it's a couple of hours later, I've already put it in the mailbox and I remember your video and I even go and watch it again. And I go, damn, I did it wrong. So is it okay for me to show up at early voting or my polling site on election day and just vote there where there's actually somebody who can help me anyway and that isn't breaking any laws? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> Um, if you fill out your absentee ballot and you submit it to the Board of Elections, if you bring it to them in person and hand deliver it there, you can still go vote in person um, early or on election day. Um, something that we've been encouraging folks who are concerned about um, COVID, I know I'm one of them, I'm a high risk person. Um, so I voted by absentee in the presidential and the primary election last year. Um, but I'm fully planning on early voting. It's a very safe way to vote. The sites are larger, they're more spread out. Um, you can choose when to go and kind of decide, I know I'm working from home now, so I may run over there during lunchtime when there's fewer people. Um, so I think early voting is a really good opportunity and you can still go vote in person even after you submit your absentee ballot. And then also from your video, I, and I just wanna reemphasize this for people, you know, we're encouraging them to do ranked choice and we want to make clear you can't give two people ones and two twos. You only can do one number one, one number two, one number three, up to five. So, but I don't really think I want five. So can I set it up some way that my first choice gets at least two from me? And then I'm just using three and four, or is it really clear no, you can only have, only have one number one. You can stop there, but you don't get to get an opportunity to be more than one person, one vote because we have ranked choice voting. So to be clear, if you fill out your ballot as Ali Swadek rank one, two, three, four, and five, your ballot will not be invalidated you just don't get to experience, I say you miss out on the fun of ranked choice voting kind of. Um, so you can do it, your ballot will be accepted, but it's the same as if you just ranked Ali Swadek rank one and didn't rank anybody else. Because if I lose a round, there's no place for your vote to go next and your, your ballot just ends there. Um, so you miss out on the fun, you can do it. I certainly wouldn't recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, I would recommend again, choosing one candidate for rank one, one, a different candidate for rank two, a different candidate for rank three, um, and so on. And again, you don't have to rank five. Five is a lot. Um, there's a lot of people running for mayor. I feel like by the end of um, this campaign, we're all going to have maybe strong enough feelings about five of them that we'll actually be able to rank all five. Um, but in, you know, there's some races like city council, there's not even five people running. If there's only three people on the ballot, obviously you don't rank five of them. <laughs> right. So and this might be for Dr. Saeed. One of the things I really love about the research I read about um, absent, um, ranked choice voting is that it encourages candidates not only to um, not be hostile to each other or speak negatively of each other, it actually encourages them to work together and as Ali said, sometimes even to cross endorse each other. It's always been my experience as someone who's been in elections that negative campaigning just discourages people from voting completely. Um, so is it your experience that we're engaging more people to participate in voting with a ranked choice system because we're not sending out messages through campaigns, we hate you all, you should hate us all and why bother to vote at all? I think that's right. I think it really is 
meant to be more inspiring all around, you know, to get people to focus on the issues that really matter to them and to make decisions about candidates from an informed perspective based on where they stand on issues, uh, which is how elections are supposed to run. And I think single choice um, elections have really turned to this negative route of attacking one another's character and personality. And I think that just raises the hostility all around between candidates and between the electorate, members of the electorate as well. So yes, I think um, by creating more choices, we're just giving people more opportunities to get more educated about issues that really matter. And does the research show any disadvantages to ranked choice voting? Some people are typing in wondering what are the arguments against this model? Um, I can jump in. So one thing that I will note um, is, and I alluded to this, you know, I've been voting for a while now. I know what to expect when I go into the polling site. I just vote for one person for each office. There's a bit of a learning curve here, right? And it's a little, it's something that folks need to get used to. Um, we're gonna have this massive voter education campaign, but let's say we don't reach everybody. It's certainly possible. There's 5 million registered voters in New York. <laughs> um, so I think there is a bit of a risk that we miss out on educating folks before they come to the polling site. And folks, you know, our brains work this way. When we encounter something new, it's a little scary. Um, you know, I've never voted. I've been talking about ranked choice voting for a very long time now, but I've never used ranked choice voting to vote. So even when I go to vote, my brain is still going to give me that ping like, this is new, <laughs> pay attention. Um, so I think that that's one thing we've seen. It is a little more confusing to voters at the beginning. And then after you use it one time, most people are like, that was great. I loved it. It was very easy. I totally understood how to use it. But again, there's there's that um, a little bit more of a barrier for comfort for voters who are used to voting. And then um, for folks who um, for folks who you know have never voted before, the idea of something new may be intimidating, and it may dissuade them from coming out at all. We haven't really seen that happen too much in other um, jurisdictions, but that is a concern and they're doing more research into that. And that's certainly something I think we'll be paying attention to here in New York. Um, turnout is not super high <laughs> in municipal races in general for presidential elections. New Yorkers love turning out to vote for um, elections for mayor and city council. We see around 25% um, turnout which isn't very high. Um, we, we certainly have a long way to go before we see something like 60% turnout, which we see for presidential years. So there's a lot of room to improve is the good thing. But I think I just wanna reemphasize that for people who are thinking, oh, it's gonna be such a production, there'll be really long lines. And yes, we did come off of presidential elections where despite the fact that we opened multiple new options of ways to vote, there were still long lines. And that was because it was presidential, at least here in New York City, it was everyone eligible for vote, wanting to get out there and frankly vote against Donald Trump. So there was a motivator there that was just huge, we saw in the New York City November election. I share the view that a June primary is less likely to see huge participation, even though there's so many people running, particularly for city council. I joke, just check, you have a family money member that's running for something in New York City. They may have forgotten to tell you so far, but literally everybody could have a family member involved in these elections. So I really do wanna urge people, even if they're thinking, this is new, I'm still a little confused. Maybe I'll just watch the first time. Don't watch, participate. Your vote can count more than ever before and in a way that you may have not thought about before. And even though there may be lines in a few places, again, early voting, you're not gonna have any lines and there'll be somebody there who will be able to explain things to you. On the day of voting, I would suspect 
there will still be not too many lines and someone there to help explain it to you. If you want to vote at home and put your ballot in the mail, you can take all of the time in the world to review it, the materials that go with it. You can watch this video again. You can call multiple offices who will be happy to walk you through it, not tell you who you should vote for, um, but help you decide and understand what the process is. Because I really do think it's a bit of a learning curve. At least one person has typed in, why can't we just keep it simple? We're making it more complicated. It does make it a little more complicated. I have to agree with the person who wrote in, but it's for a better outcome. And I think that it is well worth it personally. Um, but I, that's why I wanna make sure that people understand they have a variety of options. There's not really something can do that they will do that will make things wrong. The worst that can happen is they multi-vote in a way that the machine doesn't kick it out and they really aren't having their ranked choices counted. Um, so that's pretty much the worst thing based on error that I'm hearing. And that's not the end of the world either. Um, now, why are we not doing it for state races or federal just for New York City? So the way that this change was initiated was through a charter revision commission. Um, and so that created ranked choice voting. It, it also created the Civic Engagement Commission. We've had really active charter revision commissions in New York over the last couple of years, um, but it's just for the city charter. Um, so we can't change the New York state uh, <laughs> constitution and we can't change the US constitution. Um, we can only change the New York city charter as a charter revision commission in New York. So that's the short answer. In Maine, it was an act by the legislature and that's why they ended up voting for state races, but there would need to be something that changed in the election law in New York state. And I actually think the constitution would need to change to have it be used. Yeah, we need to explore reps. for the state. And actually <laughs> I think it's good news that we're starting you know, with the city. Um, it's very you know, local at home. People are much more likely to know their city officials. Um, sometimes it frustrates us in Albany because we think like, hello, we're here, we're doing our work, but you know, we're not on the nightly news and there aren't 8 billion reporters camped out in Albany versus City Hall. Um, so it's okay, we need both city and state and federal government to make this all work. Can you, so people are a little confused, can you go over again how the final vote is calculated if no one gets 50% in the first run through? Yes. So if no one gets 50% of first choice votes, the uh, ranked choice voting tabulation process begins. So in round one, you every single person's first choice votes are collected um, and you get an outcome that gives a percentage of the vote to each of the candidates who are running. Basically in that first round, you eliminate the candidate who has the lowest percentage of the vote. And for any of the voters who, all the voters who voted for that candidate have their vote moved to their next choice on their ballot. It gets distributed to their next choices. You recalculate the percentages and then it, it all starts over again. In the next round, you eliminate the candidate with the lowest percentage of the vote and over and over again until you have two candidates at the end. The candidate with the highest number of votes is the winner. Um, so if you have a, a race where there's four candidates running, you would go through three rounds of ranked choice voting tabulation. If you have eight candidates running, you would go through seven rounds of ranked choice voting tabulation. Um, and the important thing, I feel like this confuses people sometimes, um, the candidates do not select where your vote goes next. Your vote moves through your ballot, which is why it's important to choose a second choice and a third choice so that if your first choice gets eliminated, we know where to take your vote next to your second choice. Got it. And in fact, that relates to one question that I was a little confused at, but so the format seems to give more power to the people whose first choices are eliminated 
than to the general public. It would mean the people who choose the worst candidates will be most influential in choosing the final winner. The question is, is that correct? And I think that is not correct. Um, again, it's sticking with how you, the people, choose to rank the candidates and vote. So it's not that somebody's coming along and giving advantages to people you didn't vote for, not using your ballot sheet or using anybody's ballot sheet, um, but also opinion of who's the best and the worst is in the eye of the beholder. So often in elections, people think that the pet candidate they don't want to vote for must be you know, the worst candidate in history. Um, it goes to the negative voting we were talking about before. Um, can a, but on that note, can a voter vote for a candidate outside of their registered party? For example, can a registered Republican voter participate in the Democratic primary? Uh, I got gotten this question for 20 years as a candidate. I mean, let me take it first and you can fill in with every, the two of you wish. This is New York City. So in most geographic parts of the city, the only party that actually counts is the Democratic Party. There are not enough of you Republicans to actually have a lot of activity going on and you rarely have primaries at all. So the question is, do you like to vote in primaries? Do you like to vote and choose between different people who might actually win the general election? It's an argument for registering the Democrat. Now, I don't want people to become Democrats if they don't believe in the fundamentals of the Democratic Party, but I hear you when you talk about that you don't get choices within the Republican Party, you rarely have primaries. So one thing, if you're a Republican voter and you are ideologically a Republican, get more involved in your party, see if you can actually build up primary scenarios um, if you don't like who your candidates are um, and try to convince people that your candidate is the right one when it comes to the general election where it doesn't matter where they're a whether they're a Democrat or a Republican or some third party. In a general election, you get to vote for whoever's on the ballot that you like. Um, but if the question is, can I be a Republican 364 days a year, but I think it's fun to vote in a primary, so let me be a Democrat for the one day a year? There are states, I will tell you, that actually have a model like that. I've been in the state legislature a long time. I think that is a very unpopular worldview among the various parts of the state, the various elected officials and party officials. So there are people who make that argument, but I'm just telling you, I don't see a storyline where you're going to accomplish that goal. And that will have to be a fight for you, I believe, in Albany to change the rules of the road for party registration changes um, versus the city of New York. Um, I do think we could allow a shorter time frame to change your party registration. And Allie's shaking her head, so maybe I'll now let her give her opinion. I was gonna jump in to remind folks that if even if they did decide um, to change their political party, it is too late to do so. The opportunity has passed. Um, you had to do that by February 14th. Um, I actually spoke about this at the Civic Engagement Commission when I appeared there a couple weeks ago. Um, the change of enrollment to change your political party um, happens very far in advance of the primary election. Um, we would all, I think, in the voting and civic space advocate for the deadline to be the same as the registration date for the primary election if you're a new voter, which is um, May 28th. <laughs> I have Great. to make the pitch for the deadlines. <laughs> no, it's important, thank you. So I think you were both talking about that there's more diversity in outcomes in absentee in, excuse me, um, multi-option voting and that 
you can think about your votes differently. You know, the story of, do you vote for the one you think strategically is the right one to vote for versus the one you really love? So under ranked choice voting, are there arguments for you vote for your favorite candidate number two and your not favorite candidate number one? If people are trying to, I think, play chess with their vote, so to speak, multi-level thinking, is there a reason that they would want to not follow the gut instinct of, I like her number one best, him number two close up, her number three and mix them up because why? Is there any storyline you think that makes sense for that? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> You should vote for your favorite candidate first, your second favorite candidate second, and your third favorite candidate third, and your fourth favorite candidate fourth. But, and I think this is actually important, if you don't like a candidate, do not rank them at all. <laughs> um, because your vote could eventually go to that candidate if all of your other choices lose their rounds. So this is very important. If you do not like a candidate, do not rank them. <laughs> Um, it's, it would be counterintuitive to not vote for your favorite candidate first, because if they're winning the whole way through, then your vote stays with them. And then maybe they end up the winner, or at least they're in the final round. But if you truly have a favorite candidate, you should rank them first. Right. And on that, uh, Dr. Say, did you have anything to add there? No, I mean, I think that this, this method of voting is, is more aligned with how we naturally sort of are drawn to candidates and how we think about elections. And so I think it would be, I think we are used to doing that in single candidate elections, right? Like doing all of that maneuvering in our heads and, and this sort of is more aligned with our nature, I think. So I don't, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, I can imagine people trying to combine the two, but I think it would just make it harder. So, right. Yeah, it's and actually so, a lot. It's a lot more yeah. simple than I think we're. Everyone's trying to make it. Truly, just don't rank a candidate who you don't like, and rank your favorite candidate first. <laughs> and again, on the theory that some people are overthinking this, and that's their right. Uh, is there any logic to it? Helps my preferred choice if I only vote for one candidate as opposed to rank multiple after my first choice? Um, so this person who's asking this question would be a fan of ranking um, Ali Swadek as number one and not ranking anybody else after that. And okay. they're wondering whether that actually gives some advantage to my vote and the weight of my vote. It does not because you only ever have one active vote if Ali Swadek loses a round. There's no place for your vote to go next. And the counting may continue to folks who have ranked on their ballots. So you just miss out on being able to be included in having your vote stay active for as long as possible. Great. So these are you definitely answered, but I'm just reading the question so we can just say it one more time. May someone vote for one candidate five times, rank them one through five, rather than choosing five people. No, you don't have to choose five people, but whatever number of people you decide to vote for, they have to be in different rank order, not all ranked number one, or not all ranked number five. That doesn't work. Second question, which again, the video helped very clearly with. What if you only like three candidates? Can you leave the other two spaces blank? Yes, you can. Because as you just said, Allie, if you don't like someone, don't vote for them. Um, will ranked choice voting allow for two candidates in the same party to run in the November election? We don't have ranked choice in November, but is there some reason that the outcome here translates to a different storyline in November? No, we, um, the 
general elections will be single choice. The uh, candidates that, rep that are represented on the general election ballot will be chosen by the either primary or another process that's a little more opaque that doesn't, you, you don't get to um, vote for the candidates, but only one candidate will be representing each political party in New York State, I think is the, is the simplest way to say that. Now, there is a possibility that a candidate runs on multiple lines. And so they could show up in the November ballot as the, let's say, the Democratic candidate and also a party called the Working Families Party candidate. You still only get to vote for them once, but you can choose which party to vote for them on, correct? On the, on the November ballot? Yeah, I think the, the, so a candidate can appear on two different political parties, but only one candidate will appear on each party line. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And we saw that in um, the general election last year in the presidential race to um, where, you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris appeared on the working families line and the democratic line. Got it. So do either of you have any advice on how candidates should behave or position themselves to do well in ranked choice voting? Yeah, I can just, I mean, I think we were saying a little bit about that where, um, you know, I think it's important to think about how people are aligned on issues, candidates are aligned on issues and compare one another to that from a candidate perspective and also from a voter perspective and to think about um, like building coalitions, right? With candidates so that you encourage voters to support, really it's about supporting issues and advancing, you know, the, the most hopefully just ways to solve the problems that we're all facing as New Yorkers. I mean, when you see candidates that are similar to yours and on an issue, it's, a, it's an opportunity to encourage people to vote for that position as opposed to that person. Um, so just encouraging people to support you and support others, I think is what we're hoping to see happen. Okay. Um, are there other, other changes that are gonna happen this election? Somebody's asking about any change in requiring ID um, or other things people should know about that if they show up, they might be surprised to learn um, and they'd like to learn it before election day. No, um, there. I know there's a lot of changes happening nationally in New York state. We do not require a voter ID to come to the polls. If a poll worker asks you for an ID, you can tell them, I do not need to provide you with one. Please look me up in the poll book. <laughs> and you can give them your name and they'll do it that way. And you can eat in line. They won't fire you and not let you vote anymore, right? Um, I was actually on a very interesting email chain about this. You're allowed to give voters in line up to $1 in value items. Um, so you can get a bottle of water, a slice of pizza while you're waiting in line in, according to New York state election law. Okay, that references to some very disturbing stories I believe in the state of Georgia um, about changing the rules to find all kinds of odd and outrageous reasons to take away someone's right to vote. Um, I was quite confident we weren't doing that in New York, but I wanted to make sure we, we touched on that issue tonight. Um, just uh, so many, sorry, coming in from different places. Let's see what else we got. Um, ah, just reminding everyone that people can drop off an absentee ballot at their early voting location. So some people, again, will want to vote absentee, but feel more secure in knowing they got it to the Board of Election. So again, we had established in a previous election now that you are welcome to bring your absentee ballot to an early voting site and drop it in a box there so that you can be confident your ballot got done and got into the Board of Election in time. Um, 
someone else is asking, why can't we count the ballots that are there on election day on the night of the election and then wait another two weeks to make sure all the absentee come in and vote them and count them separately? In which case we would have, I guess, an early voting outcome, but then it might change afterwards and you have to throw them all together and do the ranking. So it seems to me that would be really complicated, but I thought I would just ask you that. Yeah, there. I totally understand why people want the want to know the results of the race as early as possible. Um, on election night, there will be something called an unofficial result that is published by the New York City Board of Elections. It will include the first choice votes only of everybody who voted early and on election day. But you're right, Senator Kruger, it would be confusing <laughs> if you ran the ranked choice voting tabulation for the folks who voted in person and then had to wait two more weeks to open all the absentee ballots. It may change who the candidate in last place is and who loses a round. You would have to rerun the whole election. It could maybe have a completely different outcome. So I don't think that that would make people feel better. I think it would be more confusing. Um, but folks should know that we will get a sense of how many first choice votes each candidate received from every voter who voted in person on election night. Um, so there's, there was a lot of words there. There's a lot of caveats, but we'll at least have some results on election night. And could you just clarify how these um, votes will be tabulated? Is it a person or people sitting there doing the math? on the side and then adding it all together? Or is there a computer program that calculates all this once the, once the data is in from all the ballots? So the short answer is right now, the Board of Elections in the city of New York is doing both of those things. Um, they have a computer tabulation program that's been used in a bunch of other places. So it's trusted, um, but it hasn't yet been certified by the state board of elections. This is very, this is a little wonky. <laughs> so stay with me. Um, but they have been hand counting the um, results of the special elections, which is actually um, something that's done in some jurisdictions. So it's not too crazy. Um, and they've managed to do it very successfully and have double checked what they've done by hand counting using that tabulation software. We hope, I mean, I certainly hope, and I'm sure every person who works at the City Board of Elections hopes this as well, that the state board will approve the tabulation software by the time the primary elections rolls around. Otherwise, it will take a very long time to hand count mm -hmm. every vote for mayor. Um, it's a lot of ballots. We're, it's pretty important that it gets certified. Right. All right. Well, we've actually made it to 825. And on my, ca my calendar of assignments, I am now at the place where I am thanking you both profusely for coming tonight, participating, bringing excellent materials, be willing, being willing to help us think through questions and answers about voting. I wanna remind everybody who's with us tonight, if you are still confused, you have months more to learn about uh, um, this new model of ranked choice voting. I know there are several other organizations that I respect who have been hosting their own town halls. And you check in with my office, we can probably find you additional um, places to perhaps see different videos or get a slightly different presentation and take on what's happening. Um, I really do appreciate um, the time of these two women. I know how busy they must be. We need to, uh, we need to get 8 million New Yorkers to understand. I don't know, they're not, that, they're not that many voters, but we would like all 8 million New Yorkers to understand what's happening and to walk in fully prepared to vote and to understand how they maximize mattering in elections. Um, I want to let everyone know that our next event will take place next Thursday, April 15th from 7 to 8.15 p.m. 
The event is titled New York City, What Can We Do After Getting a COVID-19 Vaccination? And we will have Dr. Celia Gunder, who will share with us the latest um, information about what we can be perhaps a little less guarded about, what we should not let our guard down on. Dr. Gundis is the infectious disease specialist and epidemiologist at NYU Grossman School of Medicine at the Bellevue Hospital, a CNN medical analyst, and a former Biden transition COVID advisor. Again, for everyone to please remember, we are not out of the woods yet. There are several variants of the virus that are spreading in New York City. Even if you've succeeded in getting your vaccination, I've had them both now and have beyond two weeks and I'm feeling very free and relaxed. And yet I know I still have to wear masks too preferably unless you like KN95 masks, continue to social dis distance, wash your hands frequently and continue to follow the other COVID safety practices. My office does literally daily updates on the newest information about COVID, what we should be doing, how we can get vaccinated, where we can get vaccinated. I think everybody who participates in my town halls know um, we're a very user accessible office Somebody will be there. Somebody will talk to you or get back to you if you leave messages. Um, and I want to thank my amazing staff for pulling together tonight and doing the work they do on behalf of the city of New York every day. And I want to thank our guests for doing the same and wish you all a very lovely evening because it's very spring-like today. And that certainly was cheerful. Thank you.